All right, so today I'm just going to talk for a little bit, and then we're going to go back to the section problems. But based on the questions that people had, I think I just want to motivate why we're talking about Gaussian beams at all and where they come from and how, how we manipulate them and why this is important for optics. So I'll tell you that in my lab, I have to worry about this a lot. Prof Gravodi, when she zaps her beads with lasers, uh, the zapping happens with a, a laser beam, which is Gaussian in shape. So uh, a lot of the focus parameters and uh, uh, profile of that intensity blast is, is a calculated by passing a Gaussian laser beam through a bunch of lenses. Um, Professor Donnelly and Saida work with lasers, pulse lasers, and, and uh, that's a lot of manipulating Gaussian beams. So anyone who does anything with lasers or fiber optics has to worry about Gaussian beams, but that doesn't answer the, you know, why, why these are the right type of beams to consider. So let me, let me switch to my, um, my uh, Jupyter notebook here. Hold on, let me share that. Yes. So this is uh, something that I'll upload after we finish talking, but this is very similar to what I showed before. So the first couple of things should be familiar. I'll, I'll just load the notebook, load the animations, load, load this colorize function, which allows you to plot complex things with the rainbow and a phase pattern. And I will just plot, oops, what happened here? Kernel error, aha. That might be part of the problem. Restart and clear output, yes. All right, now let me just close this. Sorry about this. Ah. Um, Okay, kernel restart and clear output. Okay. Okay, so load the animation, load the colorize function. And uh, where even is? Oh, I didn't I didn't evaluate that. Okay. Okay. Okay, there we go. Okay, so this, this should be familiar. This is um, a Gaussian beam with a waist that is almost a wavelength. And that means that the radius is, is about a wavelength. Um, the the characteristic, characteristic size over which this amplitude falls off by one over E. So like the standard deviation of this Gaussian is a little bit less than a wavelength. Now this is a really, exaggerated narrow beam. Most of them, and I think in the next the next one, I, I will plot uh, an animation of, uh, well, let me, let me just plot, let me go down two here. Yeah, this is the animation I showed before of different beam waste. So starting with almost a unphysically tiny beam waste and going to bigger and bigger beam waste, real laser beams, unless you're focusing them with, with a lens, or unless they're coming out of a fiber optic cable, they tend to be much more like the last couple frames of this animation where they're really big than the first couple frames of this animation. But the problem with showing the last couple frames of the animation is it's not, it's not super distinguishable from just a, a, a wave with a Gaussian profile that's not spreading out. And it is a little bit important that we worry about the spreading out. So I'm sort of, I will typically consider beams that are a little bit exaggerated in their amount of spreading. Uh, compared to, you know, actual actual beams that we deal with in the lab. Uh, again, except if you're trying to focus it down to a point. Um, so one thing that I didn't show you before was this. This is this is the psi, the Gaussian envelope. So this is the thing that you multiply by e to the i k z, and you get the very fast stripes going in the z direction. But this is psi, the thing we solved for, and our criteria for the approximation being good was that the scale of changes of this are, are smooth over scales of a wavelength. And so you can see this is sort of 
five wavelengths here. So even with this pretty exaggeratedly sharp, uh, sharp beam, the scale for psi is, is pretty smooth. And the biggest feature you notice is this, sort of it goes from yellow to purple. This is it going from purely imaginary to purely negative imaginary, passing through red, which is pure real. And this is that arctangent that appears in the exponent. So right, right around the origin here, sort of if you're less than negative Z naught, that arctangent has one value. And if you're bigger than positive Z naught, that arctangent has a different value. And that transition happens right here. And then there's a little bit of extra stuff in that phase having to do with uh, the other terms like R, R of Z. So this is just showing the, the phase itself without the, the fast, um, fast stripes. And then this plot is just the intensity itself. So the intensity, if you were to stick a power meter anywhere, um, well, sticking a reasonable size power meter, you would, you would just measure the, all the power coming out of this beam. But if you had a really tiny little power meter, or say you had a little fiber optic that you stuck at a particular spot, you could really probe the, the amount of power. And, and this is what you would get. It's just the magnitude squared of the, the previous two plots. Um, and the reason why it's a magnitude squared of either of the two plots is the difference between psi and the actual beam is, is just a factor of e to the i kz, and that's a purely imaginary. So the magnitude of this squared or the magnitude of this squared gives you this intensity profile. The reason why it looks skinnier is because when you when you square square small small amplitudes off off here, uh, squaring something small gives you something even smaller. So the actual intensity looks looks uh, thinner than the amplitude would look. All right, so so we already saw the animation of increasing the the beam wastes here from kind of unrealistically tiny to more reasonable focus to uh, something you might actually get out of a laser like that. And let me just show you how how psi looks at, at these different wavelengths. So, you know, I would say that our approximation that we that we made is maybe not great at the very smallest wastes. When the waste is, you know, a tenth of a wavelength, that's that's unrealistic. There, there's no way you could ever focus a laser beam that small. But starting around around here, um, these are the realistic approximations. And as the as the waste gets bigger and bigger, especially as it turns into a more realistic laser beam, pretty much all you see is this arc tangent transition between yellow on one side and red on the other side. There we go, yellow on one side, or sorry, purple on the other side. So as you get closer and closer to a real Gaussian beam that would come out of a laser, um, that arc tangent term is basically the, the dominant term uh, toward the center here. And then as you get far away, uh, it's just some constant phase offset that doesn't doesn't affect things very much. Oh, good, I was able to stop it. All right, so um, oh, and then the, I guess the last plot is the intensity with different beam wastes. So that's not super exciting. Just is less and less focused at us at a point, and more and more spread out. Um, the next thing that I wanted to show, which I don't think we've really seen too much of is those were all snapshots, say at t equals zero. So this next animation is an animation where all I've done is I multiplied our snapshot at t equals zero, that e plus function, by e to the minus, uh, minus omega t. And here, my omega is just minus two pi. Or sorry, my omega is just two pi. So this j is the complex number. Uh, 2 pi is my omega so that I can just cycle t between 0 and 1 and get a full cycle. And, uh, and uh, this animation just takes me through a, a single phase of this, uh, of this complex exponential. And then as time goes on, more and more phases will, will appear. So, so just multiplying this e plus function that we've been obsessing about by, by this complex exponential, e to the i, e to the minus i omega t, we get a traveling wave. And this is a right going traveling wave uh, because it's going in the positive, positive z direction. For positive omega means that uh, negative omega t is, is negative. Um, positive omegas 
exponentials with this negative sign go in the positive direction. And that's what we're seeing here. So this is just an animation of, of the complex beam traveling in the, in the positive direction, right going. Now let me pause that. And let's go the other way. So, uh, oh, uh, before we go the other way, let me show you the actual, so, so we've been dealing with the complex number, but that's not what we really, not what really exists out there in the real world. We really want the real part of this. So I'm going to calculate what I showed you before, and then I'm going to take that plus its complex conjugate. And that should give me the, the right going real part. And I will plot that. And I'm still, I'm still plotting it with the magnitude in phase. So uh, positive numbers are red and negative, big negative numbers are blue. And so you see peaks and troughs, peaks and troughs. Uh, and, and this is a real wave that's going out to the right. Uh, and when I have zoom and an animation, it's a little bit slow and shaky. So let me pause that animation. Let me go to the left. So to go to the left, you know, I, will, I will keep the time advancing in the positive time direction, which means that this exponential has to have a negative. But I'm going to take the complex conjugate of E plus. And that inverts left and right. So that, that makes the beam travel. Uh, instead of E to the positive IKZ, it'll be traveling in E to the negative IKZ. And I, I guess I'm still taking the real component. So we still have real peaks and troughs that are traveling. This is sort of what, what would come out of a laser pointing uh, left. And now let me do something which I, I've maybe mentioned, but I haven't really uh, showed you, which is this, is this is the beam that comes out of a laser. Inside of a laser cavity, there are there are mirrors, and between those mirrors, there's not a traveling wave, there's a standing wave. And the standing wave is the right-going real wave plus the left-going real wave. So I'll show that, I'll, I'll colorize uh, the, the sum of the left-going plus the right-going real waves. And this is, this is a standing wave, so this is, what's inside of the laser cavity. So what you'll notice is it's not moving. It's just growing in amplitude and shrinking in amplitude, growing in amplitude and shrinking in amplitude. Let me put my mouse right here at the center. You can see there is a positive number because it's red. Now it's a negative number because it's blue. Now it's a positive number because it's red. So a standing wave, it doesn't look like it's moving. It, it's standing still. Um, the, the peaks and and troughs are, are switching signs, but the zeros in between the, where, where it's black, those are not moving. And the reason why this is what's inside of the laser cavity is because there are spherical mirrors on, uh, on either side of the laser cavity. And let me show you that in the next animation. So I'm gonna just take exactly what I did before and multiply by this mask, which just zeroes out everything beyond some radius. So beyond beyond this radius, there's there's no uh, no light getting out. So this would be what what would be inside of a laser cavity if both of the mirrors were perfectly 100% reflective. You would have a standing wave that that would. Uh, fade out and fade back in. And the reason why this is the right solution to the equations, and this is uh, really the, to answer questions that people had implicitly last time, is that uh, there are a lot of solutions to Maxwell's equations, right? Plane waves, uh, traveling spherical waves. This is the solution that satisfies the boundary conditions of having these spherical mirrors on either side of a thin, thin cavity. So if we actually had spherical, perfectly reflecting mirrors on either side here, this would be the solution that you would get. 
from solving Maxwell's equations with those boundary conditions. Plane waves don't satisfy this boundary condition. Um, the, well, I, I guess we'll talk about a couple other solutions to Maxwell's equations, but these, the, the Gaussian beams plus uh, their, their cousins, which are, uh, instead of having a purely Gaussian profile, they have slightly more complicated profiles. But uh, the, that family, Gaussian or Gaussian times some low order polynomial, uh, those are the beams that satisfy the boundary conditions of having spherical, spherical mirrors where the electric field has to go to zero. And so that, that's why you have to have a, uh, a zero of the electric field not, not move. Uh, I think that's the last thing. Yeah, the, the other stuff is more for uh, for the section. So now in a real laser, you have this standing wave between two mirrors, except one of them, and, and inside of the laser, there's actually very little gas. So you, you think that the atoms are the most important part of the laser, and that, that is true. That's, what, that's what's making the light. But in terms of determining what the modes of the, the allowed excitations of light look like, uh, the, the, the gas is so dispersed that most of the light just bounces back and forth in this chamber as if the atoms weren't there. And occasionally one photon will get absorbed in an atom or an excited atom will emit an extra photon. But it can only emit those photons into patterns that satisfy the boundary conditions set by the, the mirrors. And the fact that the mirrors are, if you use metal mirrors, then the electric field has to go to zero. And you get uh, uh, medical, uh, me medical, metal spherical mirrors uh, have the electric field go to zero in, in these spherical shapes. And this satisfies the, the boundary conditions. Now, in order to let the laser light out, one of the mirrors is not 100% reflective, it's 99.9% .9 reflective. So every time uh, this electromagnetic wave waves, a, a tiny, tiny fraction of light leaks out. And that's what you actually see is the laser light. And so you think, wow, this laser is really bright. Well, actually inside of the chamber, the intensity of light is a hundred, a thousand times brighter. Um, all right, let me, let me ask if, if anyone has any questions about this kind of motivation. And, and I guess what I'm not showing here is if I were to make one of these light, one of these mirrors only uh 99.9 percent .9 reflective what you would get is you would get a standing wave you know almost a perfect standing wave inside and almost a perfect traveling wave at extremely low intensity compared to what's inside leaking out of this mirror so let me let me see if i could take questions before we uh before we jump to uh, working on section problems and if nobody has any questions, then I have a question to ask the group about this situation. Let me see if I can. Yeah, I want, I want this, I want to run this. At the end here. This is the thing that gives me the little controls so I can slide the slider back and forth. Okay. Let me actually do it a little bit more sophisticatedly. Let me make this 16 instead of I want to capture certain certain moments. Let 
while you're thinking of questions to ask. Okay, here we go. Okay, so let me animate. I, I just made the animation a little bit more fine-grained. So there is a particular time here where this thing fades completely to zero. Right? The, if you have a, a standing wave like this, it's some, some profile of intensity multiplied by some cosine. And there's some point in that cosine where everything is just zero. And let, let me ask why, how is this possible? If, if there's an instant of time where this thing we've been looking at is zero, why, why does it come back? If you solve, you solve Maxwell's equations, why, why does this come back if you start out with zero? Um, is it because like the wave, there's wave traveling in both directions and there's destructive interference at that certain point in time? And so. Uh, that, I mean, that's, that's part of it. That's certainly what we're seeing here. There's waves traveling in both directions. There's destructive interference, but there's destructive interference everywhere in space, at least in this idealization. So, you know, every, as a function of x and y and z at this particular time, this amplitude is zero. And, and what is this the amplitude of? The sum of the two waves? Uh, the sum of the two waves, but uh, it, it, it's, it's the amplitude not, not of an intensity that you would measure with a power meter, but it's the amplitude of the electric field. So, so at, at this instant in time, the electric field everywhere in space is zero. And so what, why, if you were just to solve Maxwell's equations with the boundary conditions of the mirrors, say that the field has to be zero outside of some region, and you also say at this particular instant in time, the electric field has to be zero everywhere, how come, how come you get anything but zero. Is the electric field still zero at the mirrors themselves? Uh, yes, yes. Um, the magnetic field is not zero? Yeah, that's okay. That's one of two possible uh, good answers. Yeah. So, so at this instant in time, the magnetic field must be not zero, right? And it's... Uh, all the stuff we talked about, how the magnetic field is proportional to the electric field, just off by a factor of C, um, that, that particular statement only applied for traveling waves. So for standing waves, that's, that's not true. So the electric and the magnetic field are, are out of phase. So energy is actually sloshing back and forth between the electric field and the magnetic field. So when the magnetic field, sorry, when the electric field is at a maximum, like here, there's no magnetic field. And when the electric field is at a minimum, like here, there, the magnetic field must be at a maximum. And if you look at Maxwell's equations, you can see that they trade off between, uh, between uh, electric and magnetic field. So for example, Faraday's law is that the curl, curl of B equals minus the time derivative of E So e, e can be zero, but it can still have a, a non-zero time derivative. And that, that would produce some b whose curl has to be that time derivative. So just because instantaneously the, the electric field is zero, its time derivative is not zero, uh, there's, there's some magnetic field present. And then same thing with the magnetic field. You know, with, with Ampere's law, curl of E is... Uh, plus dB dt. And in order to get the units right, I need to multiply by one over C. I think. It's 
squared. Uh, I think that's right. Um, yeah, so so the for a standing wave, the electric and magnetic field trade off in time. Okay, let me, I guess I'm done with the sort of lecture portion. Let me send you back to the, the section problems, especially the second section problem is, is important for the homework. And, and I, I made the homework, I'm gonna, I made a very short homework and I'm going to, so it's only two problems, but I'm gonna have it due right before spring break or you know either the Wednesday or the Friday before spring break, uh, just so that nobody has anything hanging. You don't have a big optics homework hanging over your head uh, over spring break. There'll be nothing, nothing expected over spring break, but there will be a short two problem homework before spring break. But one of the problems is uh, I went into lab and I have an actual Gaussian beam and I actually slid a, a razor into it, a razor blade, a knife, knife edge into it. And I did this at different, at different distances along the X direction. And I took some data and uh, you will fit, fit this data using the curve fitting techniques from the, the first, uh, the first lab, so this will be your first non nonlinear curve fit, right? Because the amount of light that you get depends on x. So, so if I were to plot as a function of x how much light you get, well, it starts out at some maximum intensity here, and then as you start sliding the laser and it goes down, 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 down. Eventually, I've covered the whole beam and it's zero. And uh, this the center of the beam here should be half of half of i max. And so I took, I don't know, 10 or 11 data points here. And so the section problem is a, a version of this where we only care about two points in particular. But as you, as you solve the section problem, uh, you, you'll get the expression for the, this curve that you will then fit in the homework. All right, questions about that? If not, I'll stop the recording and uh, let you uh, assign breakout rooms and you can play with this, this question again.